everyone, it's Teresa and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about my top 10 books of 2019. I swear this week and the next week will probably be the last, be the last 2019 centered videos I ever make. So I chose my top 10 favorite books, but I feel like if you guys, of uh, this year, uh, I feel like if you guys follow my channel or have been following me for a while, you probably know what these books are. It's not that big of a surprise. Some of them have been released in 2019, others in late, in previous years. And I have 10 here, and I believe 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 honorable mentions. So 16 books total. So let's just kind of get into it. We're going to go from number 10 all the way down to number 1. Number 10 is actually a middle grade book, and that is Everlasting Nora by Marie Miranda Cruz. Everlasting Nora is a middle grade book, as I told you guys, and it follows Nora, who is this Filipina, this, this young Filipina who has kind of seen the worst side of it all. She lost her father and her home in a fire and she and her mother now have to live in a shanty town or like in a cemetery with the rest of the homeless population in Manila or one of the biggest homeless populations in Manila. There she has to kind of figure her way around what home means to her while also trying to find her mom who went missing. Kind of heavy for a middle grade book. So I love this book for a lot of reasons. One, this is a Filipino based book. The main character is Filipino, full-fledged Filipino. She also lives in the Philippines, and we see a lot of references to the Filipino culture, the love of food, the lo the cultural um, thing of being loyal to family, and like just doing anything for your family, really. Which is honestly such a heart like a heartwarming thing to see. I don't have a lot of books by Filipinos. I have my sister loves Melissa de la Cruz, but a lot of her characters are not Filipino. They are Caucasian, I believe, or leaning toward um. European kind of mythology. So this is the first book by a Filipina written with Filipinos in mind. This was like the first book ever where I've seen a full-fledged Filipino and it's not set in America, it's set in the Philippines and like our language is not um, italicized. Our food is given like tremendous amount of love and, it's, and it shows an aspect of um, the Philippines that I think sometimes gets fetishized, especially by Filipinos who are living in America, a lot of them are always like, oh my god, look at like the poor people and like how they're like striving to be better, heart eyes, instead of actually dealing with the, the problems. I But I don't know, I haven't been to the Philippines in a long time, so I don't really know how the homeless population has changed or has not changed or has gotten better or worse. I'm just following off the things that I have seen on social media. So little disclaimer there for all my Filipinos who are currently presently living in the Philippines. But that has been my experience when it comes to Filipinos viewing like the homeless, especially people who are definitely a bit more classist and think that like, oh yeah, you won't be homeless if you just like work hard, study hard. But like not everyone has that ability. And I really enjoyed seeing that aspect and seeing mm, like my people represented in such a very honest and very raw way. I need more by Marie Miranda Cruz and like, and also trigger warning: there is death, there's child, there's like physical assault of a child, um, uh, addictions, primarily I believe gambling, and I forget what else. So I will be linking my review of the book down below if I have that. Sitting at number nine should come to no another no surprise, and that is You by Carolyn Kepnes. This is the first book in a duology, and it's essentially a psychological drama thriller following the perspective of the stalker. So this book is told in second person and we see everything through the stalker's eyes, how they fall in love, the rationalizations of everything. And it's also, as you can tell, by Penn Bagley's beautiful face, or disturbing face, that it is now a TV show. The second season is out. No one give me any spoilers. I'm catching up to some of my other TV shows right now, so I, I haven't even looked at season two yet. Um, I really love this book. I think that it does a really good job of, of like the psychological portion of showing you how someone might rationalize their actions. And we see that a lot with Joe. We see him rationalize every little detail of his interactions with Beck and every detail that she interacts with someone else. And like sometimes it's like Lolita in the sense that I've said this multiple times, where sometimes you feel like you are starting to empath like empathize for Joe, empathize, empathize, empath sympathize for Joe because of how it's written and then you're taken aback by something he says or something he does or your conscience starts kicking in being like yeah that's not an okay thing to do and then you have to be like oh right that's really shitty but I love this book so much I love the first season as well I, I watched the first season before I read the book because I didn't know it was a book 
I don't know if I'll pick up the second book. I might read it as an, an e-reader, like borrow from my library, because I don't know if I'm going to like it. People whose opinions I have trusted just don't like the second book, so I will see. I think I might bite the bullet sometime and then just like block it out from my memory later on. Sitting at number eight is The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. This is a young adult novel, contemporary novel, where we follow Ziomara as she kind of traver like tries to figure out her place in the world. She has a very religious mother, comes from a very religious upbringing, and like as she's starting to develop curves and feelings for boys, she finds that she's at a cultural clash. Ziomara, I believe, is Hispanic. I could be wrong, but I'll throw it on the screen if I am incorrect. And this book is written in verse. Now, I listened to the audiobook for this, and I absolutely adored it. I think that you should definitely read, listen to it via audiobook. I believe Elizabeth Acevedo actually narrates it, which makes it even better. I still need to pick up a physical copy of this book, but that'll happen hopefully soon. Even though I can't necessarily understand certain things that Ziomara has gone through because like I said she is Latina she does have a bigger body type than I do I can understand like the aspects of like starting to like a boy and then having it be against like your family's like upbringing or how you've been taught being religious and not finding your place in there and doing things that aren't necessarily what is accepted of your family of your culture but also finding out that these things that you're feeling are also very valid in trying to find a balance between the two. I love it. I could reread this book for ages and I can't wait to pick up the physical copy as well as Elizabeth Acevedo's second work which is With Fire on High. Super excited to read that when I get it. Hopefully that is soon but I'm also like on a miniature book buying ban until I um, knock down my physical TBR from like the 41 books that I have on there to at least 20. But I highly recommend this book. I absolutely adore it. And, it, like, I don't like things written in um, verse very well. Like, poetry and I have a very rocky relationship as it stands. But I love this. I think that if you do struggle with that aspect of, like, the poem and the verse, definitely listen to the audiobook, because the audiobook was narrated phenomenally. Sitting at number seven is Renegades by Marissa Meyer. I recently read this at, like, literally my last read of 2019. This is a YA sci-fi novel where we follow these two kind of factions of prodigies, a.k.a. people who have magical abilities, and we follow the anarchists and the renegades. Now our main character is part of the anarchists and she infiltrates the renegades to find ways to bring them down only to find her worldviews become more complicated as the story progresses. I love this book. I really only wanted to read this book because Nova is half Filipino. Like I said, I don't see a lot of Filipinos in YA in any kind of novel whatsoever. Like, at least mainstream America, a lot of the books that I have seen thus far of Filipinos have been written by Filipinos and are also only native to the Philippines. So this is like a mainstream YA novel with a Filipino main character. Half and otherwise. So that's all, really the only reason why I wanted to pick it up. Now, the reason why I didn't pick it up until like the series basically ended was because it's a superhero book and while I do enjoy a good superhero movie I sometimes feel that superheroes in general is a very visual aspect like in terms of like their powers like the explosions and like the the intrigue and everything I feel like it's very visual so that's why like comic books and like tv shows and cartoons and movies are typically the way I go so I didn't know what I was going into when I started reading this but it is such a good read I, I, Marissa Meyer did a wonderful job with the um, superhero aspect it was written really well, and we got to see both aspects of the um, the renegades and the anarchists without turning one into more of an antagonist than the other. We both see both Nova and Adrian struggle with the correctness of what the anarchists are doing and the incorrectness of what they're doing, and then what the renegades are doing and what the, both um, both on the good and bad sides. So highly recommend, and it's number seven for a reason. Sitting at number six is Circe by Madeline Miller. If you guys don't know me, you guys know that The Song of Achilles is one of my favorite books probably of all time. I have Achilles made it my top number one of 2018. I mention that book literally every chance I get. I feel like it's a book that I recommend to basically everyone when they're like, if you could recommend one book. So it's only natural that Circe ends up on this list somehow. This is a reimagining slash retelling of the Circe myth where we follow Circe from her inception all the way throughout the Trojan War and finally the end of her like her mythology life situation. This is definitely more character driven than the than Song of Achilles. Song of Achilles was heavily based in romance and the action and the development of these two characters throughout this really difficult time whereas Circe 
was more of a back character to some of these instances. We don't see her until Odysseus's side of the story, and even then she's not a main character in that in that aspect. This was very character driven and I adored it. I didn't like it as much as Song of Achilles primarily because I was expecting, I expected the vibes from Song of Achilles to transfer into Cersei. And it didn't, so it did take me a bit to get through, but I absolutely adored it. I think that Cersei is a very complex character. And while I don't agree with a lot of people saying that um, this book is a feminist book, primarily because Cersei has a lot of issues with like hating women in her life and like being not that great toward other women, I think she has very anti-feminist thoughts. I think that Madeline Miller did a wonderful job of characterizing that and giving us an avenue as to why Cersei may feel this way about other women in her life. But we also see Cersei grow so much over the course of this novel that I, I just love it. I love the characters. I loved how it ended. It was a very bittersweet but also very, very apt ending. And sitting at number five is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. This is an adult contemporary psychological book. This essentially follows this group of eccentric students who go into their graduate program to study the classics and under this teacher and as they study more about Greek mythology they become intrigued in the practices of this um, very ancient culture and find themselves descending slowly and slowly into madness and somewhat evil. I literally did not like this book for like the majority of the, of the book. I think that Henry was a very unreliable narrator and not, he's not an unreliable narrator, he's the most reliable out of the group of students but he just didn't react to anything. So I found that very difficult to get through and then when the thing happens at the end of the book it changes how I felt about the entire freaking book. I loved it. I thought that like, while I feel like Henry is the wet, wet, he is the wet wipe of this book. He really doesn't do anything and sometimes he causes more problems for the other characters because he's just, he doesn't pay attention. But when the climax happens, you realize that a lot of the things that led up to this climax have been building up and that because of Henry's unobservant unobserved nature, unobserved, because of Henry's personality, he does not really focus on the aspects that you should be focusing on and the climax becomes more heartbreaking and more of a surprise than I had ever expected, which I really enjoyed, which is why this guy is sitting at number five. And I low-key want to go ahead and reread this sometime and like take really good care and like annotate the living hell out of it. Just so I can see what parts like have been foreshadowing that climax scene. Sitting at number four of this list is More Happy Than Not by Adam Silvera. I read this for Queer Lit Readathon and it is a YA romance novel, contemporary romance novel, following Aaron Soto as he is reeling from the death of his father or the suicide of his father. He tries to find happiness in people and finds himself not working out. That is until he meets Thomas and he starts to wonder about his own past and his own feelings and it has this undercurrent of losing memory because of this Lateo Institute which will take away memories, like traumatic memories and make you like a happier person essentially. I really love this book. I didn't know what I was expecting. My friend had read it before me and she had loved it and like she said she cried but I wasn't entirely sure how I was gonna feel. Then I read it and then I cried and I have never been the same since. I think this has a lot of themes of what it means to be growing up gay in certain communities and that fear and that kind of guilt that comes with it when your families fall apart because of it. It has this Say this feeling of like would you change this huge aspect of yourself because of this underlying guilt and this fear and this almost internalized hatred about who you are even though you have found ways to accept who you are as a person. And I love this book so much. This is Adam Silvera's debut novel and it's one of my favorites of his. Like I just, I could reread it but I don't want to cry. Sitting at number three on this list is Speak by Laurie Halls Anderson. This is a YA um, contemporary novel that follows Melinda after a sexual assault occurred. Like she was sexually assaulted in a high school party. We see her struggle through this mental illness, this depression, and not being able to verbalize the words because of it. So she quite literally stops speaking. We see her find her way back to herself through art. I have never read this book. I had seen the movie when I was younger and I didn't really understand it. And I haven't been able to see the movie since, primarily because I can't find it anywhere. But I recently read the book and I was sobbing hysterically. <laughs> um, this book is very personal to me for a lot of reasons that I still cannot verbalize myself to this day. 
and it's a very difficult thing for me to really talk about, as you guys can clearly tell. However, I think this is a very important book, and it shows a lot, and it I think it shows a lot of, like, that. Um, that we need to really start focusing on, like, sexual assault survivors and, like, really give them the time and the the love that they, de that they deserve that was ultimately kind of taken away from them from this very violent act done toward their body, their personhood, their autonomy. And I love seeing Melinda sort of go from the bottom of the barrel to finding something within herself that'll keep her going and finding something that kept her from inevitably falling further into the pit because I have definitely been there and it was speak <laughs> the book has literally given me um, a bit of an eye-opening situation where I realized that I was holding a lot of things in and I had clung on to things like my writing like booktube to really um, oh I'm getting emotional to kind of cope with it so I'm very grateful for having read this book when I did because it made me realize a lot of things and made me realize that I am still healing and that's okay and f I am not in the same place that I was before um, the events of having read this book I am doing better so I think it was really good for me to read it and like find a fictional character that I could really relate to yeah it's, I don't know <laughs> It's just really important to me, I think, and I, I think it's a really important book to read in general. Number two on this list is Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. This is a young adult, this is a new adult contemporary romance following Alex as he is uh, the second, the first son of the US, the United States president. He and his family then go to visit the royal wedding as it is occurring, and he runs into Henry, Prince of Wales, and they kind of cause a scandal by accident. And in order to avoid, like, that press fire and like potential like such implications of like al alliances falling apart and stuff during the re-election they make a fake friendship and then they fall in love y'all are probably wondering so if speak was so important to you why the hell is red white and royal blue number two um for the reason that it was just a really fun read it's a gay rom-com literally it's a gay rom-com and as someone who loves her romantic comedies as someone who is queer herself and doesn't see a lot of that like fun, quirky relationship type shit in media, I really enjoyed this book. It was, like I said, super fun and quick and easy. I didn't pay a lot of attention to the political aspects of it, so I think I'll have to do a reread and go, for, go from there. But I did really enjoy this book, and it's just one of those books that, while it is super fun and super fluffy and doesn't like hold this very heavy weight in my chest, it's still a book that I would gravitate toward on a bad day and like just something that I will hold dearly to myself for what it has done in terms of like romantic comedies and like gay rom-com but also for giving me a different kind of form of happiness. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. 2019 was a weird year for me in terms of books. <laughs> so, and the last book and the first book on this list, number one, you guys really should have no surprise, and that is The Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern. This is Aaron Morgenstern's sophomore novel and follows Zachary as he finds an authorless book in his university's library and sees that it details a part of his life he has never talked about and barely kind of remembers himself. This then kind of catapults him into the secret society of where stories and books are treasured and starless seas and pirates and all these things. I have a vlog detailing about this. Y'all can go ahead and watch it. I love this book for a lot of things. One, I loved it for the storytelling. It's very lit fic and I don't like a lot of like literary fiction, but more Air Morgenstern's writing per like prose is just absolutely marvelous. It's just so lyrical and descriptive without taking away too much from imagination. I love her characters are so complex and so like not different but how she wrote them is different from how I feel anyone else that is popular at present would write them. I love the subtle queer aspect of this book. It's it's something that I like, especially um, when we are getting more and more um, novels out there featuring featuring queer characters, where their queerness is not coming out. It's not them figuring out that they're queer. We have them when they are when they have when they know they are queer, and it's like an extra added bonus to the story itself and I really like that. I feel like that's um, something that I need more of because while I do love my good old-fashioned coming out story, I need more books to start normalizing queerness because I feel like at present we are 
at the peak of coming out stories like we can't really like be overdone with them but we have reached a point where we see a lot of them and while that is important and it is great because everyone's experiences of coming out are vastly different and that needs to be represented I would like to see the normalization of queer um, rom romances even in subtle ways like does that make sense I would like to see them more where they're not coming out they know who they are and we just get to see them fall in love that's, that I think is something that I would like to see more in literature. Now on to my honorable mentions, since I have been talking for probably like 40 minutes now, definitely 40 minutes, I'm just going to keep it rather short and simple and give you guys just kind of the names and why I like them. Very brief why I like them. The first one on this honorable mentions list is Girls with Paper and Fire by Natasha Nyan. Sapphic Asians. Sapphic Asians set in an Asian background. Pretty covers. Sapphic. It's Asians. Gay. Then the next one I read as an audiobook, and that is Sadie by... Shoot. I'm gonna uh, leave the name on the screen, because I can't remember. I'm confusing it with Alice Oseman, but it's not Alice Oseman. Basically, this is podcast format slash mystery of figuring out who killed someone, and we follow dual perspectives. And it's the audiobook is amazing. It's, it's very atmospheric, and I highly recommend. The next one is They Both Die at the End by Adam Silvera. It's like a gay dying Tinder, but without the hookup culture. It's very heartbreaking. I absolutely adore it, so definitely recommend it. I did, even though I knew they were gonna die, I didn't expect them to die. Then we have Becoming by Michelle Obama, nonfiction. Michelle Obama. Don't know what else you want. And then we have Ivy Aberdeen's Letter to the World by Ashley Herring Blake, middle grade, semi coming out, semi figuring yourself out story, lots of tragedy, but also really heartwarming. <laughs> it's just so cute, and I recommend it to literally everyone. Then we have Doctor Sleep by Stephen King. This is the sequel to The Shining, one of the most satisfying conclusions to a duology I have ever read. Stephen King writes children so well, really creepy, really atmospheric, and I read this in like three days, I think. And finally, again, no surprise, and that is Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. 60s to 70s aesthetic, rock band, romances that tear at your heartstrings, complex characters, Fleetwood Mac inspired. But that is it for my top 10 of 2019. I really need to stop talking in videos so much. I'm really sorry, you guys. My videos have been like 30 minutes long for the past like month. I'm gonna try to shorten them down, but I babble. Maybe it'll go down to like 20 minutes next month, but right now we're just gonna stick with the length that we are at. If you guys like this video or you guys wanna discuss your favorite books of 2019, leave them down below. Hit like, subscribe, comment, follow me on social media, all that fun stuff. Any books that I have mentioned will be left down below, and if I have a, re a review for them, there will be trigger warnings with that said review, because I did forget to mention the trigger warnings, so. But until next time, I'll talk to you guys everywhere else, and I hope you guys are having a wonderful week, and I hope you guys are reading books you really love in 2020 already. We're at, like, what, the sixth day when I'm filming this? So, yeah. Bye!